Hi, my name is Chris Watford, and I'm here to tell you why the London Underground uses a fourth rail system of traction current power supply as opposed to the more widely used third rail system found on some of the mainline railways in the south of England. Due to my railway safety background, and as a fellow of the International Institute of Railway Electrification Engineers, over the years I've been spending many hours deep underground engaged in various training work and as a freelance communications consultant for LUL and its contractors. One such contractor, Seaboard Powerlink, asked me to help write and narrate a short programme called London Underground Unearthed in the late 1990s, and it is this that you are about to see now. It will explain that, in addition to the two running rails needed for all conventional railways, why not just a third, but a fourth rail system has been adopted for use in track systems throughout the underground network. So, if you're interested in railways and electricity, this programme is for you. The London Underground is famous throughout the world. It was the world's first underground railway and is still one of the largest and most complex systems in existence. One unusual feature of the London Underground is the use of the four rail system of electrification. Why is this unusual? Well, most electrified railway systems, which use conductor rails as opposed to overhead electrification, use a three rail system where the running rails act as the return conductor. The three rail system functions perfectly well. It is safe enough and saves money on having to provide and maintain extra rails and additional equipment on trains and in the electrical substations. So why does London Underground use the four rail electrification system? Well, the original reasons for choosing the four rail system date back to the early years of the century. It was feared that corrosion of underground pipes and cables could result from the use of a three rail system below ground because of the leakage of currents to earth. The four rail system provided a secure and insulated return path, something that also simplified the use of electric track circuits for signalling. The four rail system has one other advantage. What is it? Well, simply that it can continue to supply power to trains if either the negative or positive insulation fails. This is not the case on a three rail system because if the insulation of the third rail fails, a short circuit current flows and the substation circuit breakers open. This means that the service is interrupted. But, as with many good things in life, this advantage comes at a price. If an insulation failure occurs on one pole of our system, let us say the positive, then there is no big problem. But if the insulation fails on the other pole at the same time, large currents can circulate via earth. If the insulation failures are close together, enough current will flow to open the substation circuit breakers. But if the failures are further apart, the earth fault current is no more than normal load current and the circuit breakers remain closed. So a current of up to 4.5 thousand amperes can circulate uncontrolled via earth. If this happens, part of the current path will eventually overheat, burn out and cause an arc. If this arc is in a tunnel, or worse still, on a train in a tunnel, the consequences can be horrendous. So what can we do to prevent such an incident? Well, since we need two faults to cause an arcing incident, we need to do two things. Split the railway up into sections so that a fault in one section can't get together with a fault a long way down the track and detect and remove the first fault as quickly as we can, that is before a second one can occur. 
Well, the first stage was to divide the underground's electrical system into smaller parts. Each line is divided into a number of sectionalization sections. A typical section would be section 8, which covers the Piccadilly line east of Holloway Road. Separation of this section from its neighbouring ones is achieved within the substations by maintaining bus coupler switches in the DC bus bars in the open or off position. Outside the substation, the normal four foot long substation gap in the conductor rails is extended to 48 feet. This makes it impossible for trains to bridge the gap because although the collector shoes of any particular car are interconnected, it is impossible for the shoes at one end of a car to be in contact with one section and shoes at the other end of the same car to be in contact with the neighbouring section. In this way, any earth fault occurring anywhere on the system will only affect that one section. Locating faults within the few miles of one section is obviously far easier than investigating the whole line or the whole system. Once we have divided the system into manageable sections, we need a way of detecting the fault. If you are electrically minded, you may have already realised that we can do this by measuring the track voltage. The problem is, however, that in theory it is not possible to measure a fault voltage from a conductor rail to earth on a four rail system because there is no earth reference which can be used as a return path for the current needed to operate the meter. To solve this problem, we install earth bleed resistors at the track side at each end of every sectionalization section. These are very high power resistors consuming 13 kilowatts per set and with a considerable amount of heat generated by a current of 2.1 amps flowing through the 300 ohm resistor bank. The 300 ohm resistor is split into proportions of 100 ohms negative to earth and 200 ohms positive to earth which sets the normal track voltages at 210 volts and 420 volts respectively. The track voltage is monitored continuously, but the voltage measurements are taken between the negative rail and earth only, as it is not necessary to measure both. If a serious fault, in the order of 0.5 ohms, was to be experienced between the negative rail and earth, the effect would be that the voltage between the negative rail and earth would drop from the normal 210 volts to almost zero, whereas the 420 volts on the positive rail would increase to almost 630 volts. It is worth noting that a simultaneous fault of 0.5 ohms on the opposite positive pole would cause a total fault current of over 600 amps, which is enough to cause serious arcing and even a fire. Remember how helpful it was to split the railway into sections? Well, in many places there are extra buzz bar coupler circuit breakers. These are usually kept closed to maximise efficiency, but they can and should be opened up by the electrical control room if an earth fault happens nearby. This divides the railway up into even smaller sections, so reducing the chances of arcing and fire even further. To summarise then, the four rail system helps reliability, but it brings with it risk. If two simultaneous insulation faults occur, allowing currents to flow via earth, arcing and fire will almost certainly result, probably on a train. To minimise the chances of that happening, we can do two things. Find and remove earth faults as quickly as we can. Where they exist, use normally closed buzz bar coupler circuit breakers to create small electrical sections until the first fault has been removed. Remember, keep the time short and the area small to keep our customers safe. <laughs> now cast your mind back to what we said about sectionalization. Think how long the average section is. Oh, that's enough of that. Let's get on. Each section is normally double track, so inspecting the whole length of track for metallic foreign objects would entail quite a hike. If the fault was in a tunnel section, then the problem would be even greater, remembering that all cables and disconnection panels would also need to be inspected, not to mention keeping an eye open for broken rail bonds. 
If we can reduce the length of track to be inspected, then tracing the cause of the fault will be easier and quicker. This is how we proceed. At a substation approximately in the middle of the section containing the fault, arrange for the track circuit breakers feeding all the tracks on one side of the substation to be opened. In this case, switch off all the track circuit breakers at substation C feeding towards substation B. This will not normally affect track supplies as the tracks are usually double end fed from neighbouring substations. If this switching has been completed and a fault is still being indicated, then it is located somewhere between substation C and the end of the section containing the voltmeter somewhere between substations A and C. However, if the fault has disappeared, then it lies beyond the position of the open circuit breakers. In other words, between substation C and substation D. Assuming that the fault is still being indicated, then it can be located more precisely by restoring the original feeding arrangements and then opening the track circuit breakers midway along the faulty section. In this case, opening all the track circuit breakers at substation B, feeding towards substation C. Again, if the fault indication remains, the fault lies between the open track circuit breakers and the end of the section, that is, between and including substations B and A. But if the fault has disappeared, then the position of the fault lies on the track, or in the track cables, between substations B and C. But if so, on which track? By reclosing all of the track circuit breakers, then opening two diagonally opposite breakers at a time, it can be established which track contains the fault. To inspect one set of tracks and cables between a pair of substations is a much easier task than the one we started with. This is the basic method of detecting the location of a fault. However, there can often be more complicated situations to deal with, for instance, where there are four tracks. In this case, the elimination process is merely extended as here. A further complication would be if there was a lift and escalator feeder cable. This might need isolation, but beware because these cables are normally single end fed and may require special switching. It must not be forgotten that a fault could exist within the traction substation, and this would be evident if the fault could not be located to either side of a substation. If the fault is traced to the track containing the earth bleed resistor, the resistor fuses should be checked first, because if they have blown, this would give a permanent fault indication. It can be seen that the path of the earth fault currents is along one of the running rails, the continuous earth rail. One running rail contains the signalling block joints, while the other is connected to the earth rods near the substations and is electrically bonded throughout its length. If these bonds are broken for any reason, earth currents may use any available conductive path. As a result, continuity bonds are regularly inspected. We have so far addressed the electrical theory behind the subject of earth faults and the principles of how they can be located. We will now look at the procedures to be adopted. In other words, who speaks to whom? This is laid down in the reference or working manual and must be followed. When an earth fault occurs, it can be detected at one of two places. Either one, in the line controller's office by an alarm system that gives an audible warning as well as a visual indication showing the polarity of the fault. Or two, within the electrical control room by recording voltmeters. These also contain an audible alarm, but have the added advantage of being able to show the level of fault and, by the actual pattern traced by the voltmeter, help to indicate the type of fault. For example, here is a traction motor fault on a train. First, the exact time that the fault occurred must be logged. The line controller will take the time and add to it the longest time normally taken for a train to pass through that section. He will take account of any delays to the services at that time. 
At the end of this total time, one of two situations will exist. Either the fault is still apparent, in which case its location is permanently within the section and may be caused by a track fault, a cable fault, a lift or escalator fault, or by a defect within a substation. Or the fault has disappeared, in which case it is probably mobile and is most likely on a train. Check to see if the fault has transferred to a neighbouring section. If so, at what time? Which trains pass that point around that time? With luck, you may already have identified the faulty train. If the fault has disappeared without being transferred to another section, check if there are any rolling stock depots that the train may have entered. These are usually isolated from the main traction current section. Again, check which trains were due to return to the depot. Remember that at some points on the underground, trains leave our system and run over routes owned by rail track. Here, the line controller will have to consider the normal running times to the end of the line and back. For example, he would need to take into account the running times from Turnham Green to Richmond and back. After this time, the fault might reappear on section 10. Eventually, it may be established that the fault is not on or caused by a train and has remained in one section. In this case, the line controller and electrical control room operator must liaise to agree the most effective way to proceed. This must be by mutual agreement, since each party has access to certain information. For instance, only the electrical control room operator will know where substation maintenance is being carried out. Remember that where circuit breakers have been isolated, single-end feeding could inadvertently deaden the track. Likewise, only the line controller will know where the gaps in the service or timetable are sufficient to allow traction current to be temporarily discharged if need be. If the fault has been located in an open section, the line service centre should be requested to send a technical officer to inspect the area for obvious faults. If the fault is located in a tunnel, an inspection may not be possible until the start of engineering hours. Where the situation is urgent, for example if a second opposite polarity fault has occurred, the service may have to be suspended while an inspection is carried out. Were this second fault to be on a train, it is imperative that the train is not allowed to enter the section containing the original fault. The train must either be rerouted, withdrawn from service and stabled in a suitable siding or rolling stock depot, or, if this is not possible, the service may have to be suspended. The risk of a serious train fire must be avoided at all costs. It has happened before and it could happen again. But remember, that there is no need for immediate panic the moment an earth fault occurs. Our use of the four rail system gives us the opportunity to trace the fault and deal with it in a logical way.